I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this exciting symposium. Um, and I would like to apologize for not being able to give this talk in person uh, due to an unforeseen conflict. Um, the topic I was given to talk about uh, is gut microbiota and the brain paradigm shift in neuroscience, which is really the title of a symposium that um, um, I co-organized with uh, Rob Knight uh, last fall at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in Washington, D.C., and which drew a, a huge audience um, indicating the great interest of neuroscience in this topic. Um, what is a paradigm shift? So there's a very interesting book about the structure of scientific revolutions by uh, Thomas Kuhn, 1962, um, taking a, a paraphrased sentence um, from a review of this um, book, science is a series of peaceful interludes punctuated by intellectual violent revolutions in each of which one conceptual worldview is replaced by another. Uh, <clears throat> so one of those uh, violent revolutions uh, is clearly the uh, emergence of the role of the gut microbes in gut brain communications um, a little bit longer than a, than a decade ago. Um, and I'll give another couple of examples where such um, revolutions have occurred and um, hopefully at the end we'll convince you that we clearly um, are undergoing this, uh, par this paradigm shift um, in our conceptualization. Before I do this, I would like to emphasize, even though we are going through this current paradigm shift, the concept of gut microbes uh, communication with the brain, the nervous system, uh, and our body is not that new. Humans have had a long ongoing fascination with the role of dysbiosis or intestinal putrefaction or auto-intoxication in the etiology of chronic disease, including psychiatric disease, um, and also a fascination with counteractive manipulation such as purging diets, cleansing, enemas, colectomies, and fecal transplants. Um, so this pre-scientific concept has been around for a long time. I think we talk about the paradigm shift, it's really talking about the science uh, that for the first time is supporting some of these um, um, concepts. Um, one example um, in uh, psychiatry were um, an unfortunate history of psychiatry where uh, the gut microbiome is put putrefaction or this um, Fermentation and abnormal fermentation dysbiosis has been implicated as a cause for psychiatric disease. Um, and um, many um, um, non consenting and innocent patients um, underwent colectomies. Um, this procedure, even though it was done on hundreds of um, um, innocent patients, never was evaluated um, in its effectiveness in a controlled clinical trial. And, um, later, uh, there was a shift. People realized uh, the colectomies were too radical. A lot of people died during these procedures. And then maybe treatment with probiotics may actually do the same thing. So this concept of that treating depression with probiotics um, was, uh, also came up in the early parts of the um, uh, 20th century. So we got to the more scientific concepts. I would like to start this, illustrate this with the example of toxoplasmosis, um, not a benign um, microbe, but a parasite. It's got a lot of um, bad press. Probably the best press it got was in a Scientific American article by uh, Robert Sapolsky. So what's interesting, and that's the only reason that I bring up this, um, this parasite, is that it's an example of the tremendous intelligence programmed or developed during evolution that microbes, um, in this case uh, parasites, have developed to manipulate brain circuits in a very unique way. So typically um, what's important for the reproductive circle of uh, toxoplasmosis is can only reproduce in the gastrointestinal tract of cats. Um, the, the organism lives in mice, so the only way to get a mouse in safely into the gastrointestinal tract of a cat is to overcome this inborn aversion um, that mice have from cats. And what happens um, that, that infected um, mice actually, 
uh, the organism goes to their brain and changes parts of the limbic circuitry. So instead of the aversion, the mice all of a sudden feel sexually attracted to the smell of cat urine and are being ingested in, in higher numbers by the cats. Ultimately, this organism, uh, as we know, is, is detrimental if a woman acquires this during pregnancy. But it also, it's intriguing, not time here to discuss this, that about 20% of the healthy population have cysts of that organism in their brain, and we don't know if that has any effect uh, on health or well-being. Another kind of, um, this is an example of a, uh, a revolutionary event um, or process that has happened in this field was when a series of studies came out in, in mice, um, sometimes genetically engineered, sometimes um, the majority of these studies with, um, done in, uh, in uh, germ-free animals. Um, one example shown here is that um, um, obese mice that are obese because they over-ingest food, so somehow an alteration in their um, ingested behavior circuits within the brain. If fecal materials are transplanted into germ-free lean mice, um, these mice also start overeating um, and become obese. Most important thing here is, um, in the context of gut-brain interactions, that the ingested behavior is altered, so these mice ingest more if food is available. Many other examples that you'll hear during this symposium by other speakers. A summary of these, of the, the main findings that have been reported um, in rodents um, have shown that in some ways the gut microbes are involved in the regulation of nociceptive reflexes, the rodent equivalent of pain in emotional behaviors, social behaviors, ingestive behavior, um, as I mentioned, and that some of these altered behaviors are associated with alterations in the brain neurochemistry and the HPA axis. Um, what's the mechanism by which these organisms, um, the, the microbes, the good guys in our gut, can communicate with our brain? Um, an extensive body of evidence has accumulated um, indicating, showing the pathways by which several cells within the lining of the gut, within the epithelial layer, uh, can transmit signals um, to the brain, um, shown here for an enteroendocrine or entochromaffin cell, for immune cells, for um, afferent sensory neurons, all of which can send signals out to the brain, often by the vagus nerve, sometimes by the circulation, and also the top-down signals from the brain that can affect circuits within the enteric nervous system, changing the gut function and also secondarily the environment of the, the microbes. So we add the microbes now, these 100 trillion organisms in our gut lumen, um, and we have learned that many of these or most of these organisms have developed mechanisms by which they communicate with uh, the immune system um, through metabolites that can go through the um, uh, epithelial barrier and get into the circulation um, by activating uh, sensory nerve cells, and also that they can be influenced um, by um, descending pathways from the brain, sympathetic nervous system. Good example is serotonin release into the gut lumen or norp norepinephrine release, which changes the behavior and the gene expression profiles of gut microbes. Um, it is intriguing that 100 trillion of these microorganisms are separated from all these sensors by a tiny layer of uh, epithelial cells in our gut. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Looking at one of these cells, namely the enterochromaffin uh, cell, um, another kind of um, paradigm shifting moment has occurred, or finding has occurred on, only recently, actually two of those, um, that have shown this intricate connection between the gut microbes on the luminal side um, and the um, nerve pathways that link these, um, um, uh, these enterochromaffin cells to the brain. So on the luminal side, enterochromaffin cells contain 95% of the organism's serotonin, have receptors responsive to gut microbial metabolites, such as short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, the bitter taste receptors, um, TLRs, the entire instrumentarium that will respond to signals or can respond to signals from these microbes. Here is one of the latest findings, which is quite revolutionary. 
um, these ECC cells are synaptically connected uh, to vagal afferents via um, these neuropods um, and to postganglionic sympathetic nerves. So they, are, they can be viewed as an extension of the brain or as like the, um, the, um, the eyes of the brain that looks into the gastrointestinal tract. So synaptic connection. So signals from the gut microbes um, can be transmitted um, and there's setting up a bidirectional interaction between brain, enteric nervous system and the gut. So close um, um, interaction between these cells and the immune system. Um, and then what's interesting is that serotonin is not only released when we ingest a toxin or um, undergo chemotherapy, um, where you have a, a burst of serotonin release, which typically causes nausea and bad sensations. But there's almost certainly a um, low tonic release, so a tonic communication through the system, which, for example, during development could play a role in, um, during early life could play a role in, in development. Slightly different way of looking at these communications, I want to just emphasize a couple of points here. These communication channels between the microbiome, the epithelium, and the brain is, um, even though we list here the separate channels, the immune system, circulatory system, the vagus nerve, um, and these top-down descending pathways. Um, there's a crosstalk between all these pathways. This is not a stable, um, static system. Um, but there is a crosstalk between all players, both in the periphery, but also during the communication. Um, there's an, there are two barriers that the signals have to go through. One is the epithelial layer of the gut. One is the blood-brain barrier. Both of these, again, are not static. They're dynamic. So the epithelial permeability in the blood-brain barrier um, can be altered. And they can be modulated both by the brain during stress, for example, but also by gut microbial metabolites and by inflammatory molecules. So you have a very complex multi-channel but interconnected system that is dynamic in the amount of information that it allows to flow from the um, gut to the brain. Now, how, do, how did the microbes learn to communicate with the brain? Or is that the wrong question? It, should we really ask, did the brain learn from the microbes? And it's really the latter question that's the more appropriate. Um, microorganisms are the most abundant um, um, biomass in the oceans. They have lived there for 3.5 billion years um, b before any animals appeared on, on planet Earth. Um, and they've had time to perfection, to perfect a system of communication through molecules that they produce to talk to each other. Um, once the system was perfected, the animals appeared. So this is the, an example of the hydra, one of the most primitive marine animals appeared about 500 million years ago. And this was the animal where apparently microbes and algae first uh, made the decision to settle in the gut of these uh, animals. They had primitive um, enteric nervous systems. And then uh, this turned out to be, this synergy uh, or symbiosis turned out to be quite um, productive for the benefit of both, um, that it was maintained in all the mammals and animals that came afterwards, um, including humans um, about a million years ago. So we also have evidence that the neurotransmitters that our enteric nervous system in the brain uses are really derived from lateral gene transfer of these, the same molecules that the, the microbes had used and per perfected for billions of years. Now, does the these revolutionary findings that have really started this paradigm shift in thinking about the gut microbiome and the brain, does that have any relevation for um, human disease and health? Um, many investigators believe so. Um, as you can see here from um, provocative titles um, and words that have been used by um, several authors, like the concept of psychobiotics, that probiotics have a psychiatric effect uh, on our brain or mind-altering organisms, also implying that um, th there is an established role of these uh, or counterpart to these findings in, in humans that have been originally observed in um, rodents. The problem is we don't have the convincing evidence for that um, in large amounts of data. Um, one of these uh, such studies that so we were interested a couple of years ago 
could we manipulate the, the, the gut microbiota in healthy people um, and detect the signal at the brain using functional uh, MRI? Um, without going into details of this study, as I said, it was done in healthy individuals. Um, they, they took um, for four weeks a, a probiotic mix um, twice daily uh, and were assessed in detail with behavioral questionnaire um, um, and brain imaging um, evaluations at the beginning and at the end of this four-week period. The task of the many tasks that we asked the subjects to do was to do this face recognition task where they had to match um, an emotionally valenced face with another face with the same emotional expression. So validated test uh, has been used extensively in psychological and psychiatric studies. What we found to our surprise that um, um, compared to a no therapy control group that didn't uh, receive anything, a control group that get, got a indistinguishable non-fermented milk product um, and, a, and the test product, which was the probiotic mix, we found an extensive a differential engagement or connectivity with an extensive brain network that in, contained um, several sensory regions, such as the insula and the um, um, somatosensory cortex and pain modulatory regions, um, as the first evidence in humans that by manipulating the gut microbiota, you can actually change something at the brain level. Fairly fundamental reflex response um, that has to do with, um, with, with emotional regulation. We also found in a, in, in a later study, we were interested, is there a correlation between the gut microbial composition and the brain architecture? Um, so be, not just between the function of the brain, but also between the, uh, the wiring. I'm show, gonna show you an example for the, um, uh, so this here is an example, an, an image from uh, white matter connectivity um, obtained by DTI imaging. Um, I'll show you an example of what we found looking at um, gray matter parameters in, in, in the brain. Um, and here we asked the question, is there this correlation between a, a clustering of the bacteria into certain um, microbial clusters and brain structure? Um, what we did here is um, um, in these healthy subjects, um, we identified Prevotella and Bacteroides predominant subgroups. And we were able just using a combination of structural gray matter parameters from the brain to identify and completely separate um, these two subpopulations, um, the one that had Bacteroides predominance and the one that had Prevotella predominance. So there is in some ways a correlation between uh, the brain and the gut microbiota. If you look at the regions, so this goes from top to bottom, the regions that show the greatest um, impact on this classifier. And we see uh, frontal regions, but also basal ganglia and um, sensory uh, motor regions. We did another study, so the, early, the, the last two examples were in healthy controls. We did another study recently in patients with IBS. Um, based on 16S analysis, we found similar to um, study previously published in, in, in gut by um, Magnus Simran and um, uh, Paul O'Toole. Um, we, uh, we found that there were really two subgroups of IBS patients. Um, one that was distinctly different from the healthy control. So these are the uh, Firmicutes and the Bacteroides, the two uh, predominant um, phyla in, in the human microbiome. Um, but we also found the subgroup of IBS patients that were not statistically different from the healthy controls. When we looked at, again, at the brain structure that um, correlated with these two subtypes of IBS patients, we found that the, um, the subgroup with the increased Firmicute to Bacteroides ratio had smaller uh, volumes, gray matter volumes, in certain brain areas in the frontal part of the brain predominantly and in the um, sensory motor area. Um, this also ap applied to other areas here, um, including the anterior insula. And then there were other areas of the brain that were the, um, were the IBS subgroup with the abnormal Firmicute to Bacteroides ratio had increased volumes. And that included um, sensory um, 
regions within the sensory um, pathway, such as the thalamus and the um, basal ganglia. So a series of, I would say, initially uh, initial observations, all of which need to be reproduced and validated in larger follow-up studies before we can really take this um, as a definitive proof for this connection, but this pretty strong evidence, both functionally and structurally, that the gut microbes have a connection with brain function and, st and structure um, analogous to what has been reported in the animal studies. Now, with any paradigm shift, the main question is, how will this shift our understanding of human disease? Um, there's a lot of excitement at the moment, um, and many of these are, I would say the most of these are really still in, sp speculative, in a speculative state because we have not found the translation between the animal data and the humans, but there's certainly a lot of activity and research going on in these areas. So from autism to obesity, food addiction, anxiety, depression, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. In each of those disease areas, possibly different are these um, different communication channels um, and different mechanisms uh, involving the gut microbiome, brain axis may be involved. Um, it has been proposed, and it's a very attractive um, concept, that the windows where these interactions have the biggest impact on health and development are early in life, um, where the diversity of the gut uh, microbes are lowest. It's still a work on the construction where the, the, the final composition uh, develops the first three years. Um, and people have speculated um, that in many neurodevelopmental disorders, that is the period where um, th there's the greatest vulnerability for influences through the gut, through, through uh, diet, um, and other factors to have an impact on the developing brain. And similarly, the neurodegenerative diseases at the end of the life spectrum where again the, the gut microbial diversity goes down. Um, so diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, this may really be the window where, where this plays an important role. I personally believe that in the middle of the, the lifespan that the ingestion of um, probiotics, at least currently available probiotics, will have minor, possibly significant effects on well-being, digestive function, and, and others, but not on major brain diseases. Um, just coming back to this, the early life period, clearly a major factor were um, the interface of prenatal, of prenatal factors that act on the gut microbiome axis and postnatal factors, so including um, um, in, in uterine development, uh, factors during pregnancy, such as maternal stress, nutrition, infection, uh, medication, and postnatal factors, including the delivery mode, um, feeding, breastfeeding versus formula, and use of probiotic supplements or antibiotics, all of which have been shown in animal models to have pretty profound um, effects on the microbiome. So the last two slides, let me just speculate and think for conceptually and analytically this field may be going in, in humans to get a better understanding. Um, we, are, we have realized that each components um, of the brain-gut axis are not single cells. There's not going to be a single cell or a single microbe that will cause disease. Um, all of these um, players are really complex networks, dynamic networks um, that, um, that interact where all, where a lot of different cells and components interact with each other. We have learned and have um, published, our group has published on this, on the way we can do this at the brain, the brain connectome all the various networks, how they interact. Um, but then once we understand how these individual networks work, to come to a fundamental basic understanding of the um, gut-brain microbiome interactions, we really need to look at the connections of these various networks. So this is like a, a meta systems analysis of the multiple components, each of which is its own system. But to understand this, we, we will have to identify what are the hubs uh, within this meta network, because these hubs are most likely the, the, the targets for the most effective uh, therapies. Thank you for your attention.